about to jump into the burning bush, and I'm sort of trying to clear the decks before we jump into this whole idea. Jump into the burning bush episode, I meant, by the way. Um, let's recognize that Moses was rejected before he saw the burning bush. It's a very interesting order of things. He was rejected before he saw the burning bush. Okay, anyway, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Horeb, by uh, scholars that I know, that seem, they regard Horeb as the range, Mount Sinai as the specific peak within that range. For those of you that wonder, gee, I thought it was Sinai, what's Horeb doing here, and so forth. Uh, as often as the case in geographic names, the, you have what's called a synecdoche. That is, uh, just like around here, we sometimes say Balboa when we mean, mean Newport Beach, etc. That sort of approach. Uh, the, the general is taken for the specific and the specific for the general, if you will. In any case, Horeb and Mount Sinai are synonyms as far as you and I are concerned. I think Horeb is the more generic of the two words, but they're the same area. Uh, Sinai is the specific mountain we'll discover in Exodus 24, but that's getting ahead of the story. The same location is kind of interesting for, some, for a number of reasons. God seems to be using this location, not only because it's the place where Moses is called, it's also the place where he brings them back later. It's also the place where Elijah meets the Lord and is commissioned. You'll discover that in 1 Kings chapter 19. There's also a tradition among many scholars, and I'm not sure of the basis for it, but there's a tradition that it was at Mount Sinai that Paul was uh, given the gospel. Paul was schooled separately, in spite of the fact that he was a, you know, a student of Gamaliel and all that. When he became converted, he disappears for a while. And uh, from Galatians chapter 117 and 425, some scholars infer that he may have actually been in exile himself and got uh, a special revelation in, uh, in this area. But that's speculation. I mentioned just for color and background. Now, uh, Interesting passage, but I suggest we do, is take the next, uh, through verse 5. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not near here, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And then God goes on to uh, begin this commissioning. You know, it's interesting. One thing I was fascinated by uh, in the movie, The Ten Commandments, because they did capture this reasonably well, because uh, there Moses uh, was tending the flock, looked up and saw this bush burning up on the hill, and was, it had this very reaction. Why is it burning and not? And he was intrigued with it, and he climbed up. Of course, he climbed over rocks and canyons and stuff. He wondered where, by the time he got through climbing, that he could see where from. But anyway, that's, that's script, scripting. The point is, if it was a bush burning, that would not have attracted him. The concept of spontaneous combustion out in the wilderness is not unknown. There's a lot of ways that that can occur. The fact that there was a, a lone bush burning and uh, dying away is something that would have caused notice, but certainly not the climb up, to, up a hill to see what's really going on. It's interesting to notice that what attracted Moses was that the bush was burning but not being consumed, that is, continually. It's just burning and burning and burning and doesn't consume. Bear in mind, Moses is 40 years in the wilderness. He's familiar with the area. He's not encountering some natural phenomenon that's explainable. Now, uh, if you look up the word bush, you'll discover the only other passage that it appears in is in Deuteronomy 33, 16. And uh, that, that might be worth our taking a quick peek. Those of you that uh, know how I can dwell on trivial things would like to... Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 16. And for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the good will of him who dwelt in the bush, let the cleansing come upon the head of Joseph, on the top of him who was separated from his brethren. Do you notice the way the word bush is referred? 
it's the abode of him who dwelt in the bush. What bush are they referring to? The one we just read in Exodus 3. Good. The word dwelt there in the Hebrew is shachan, from which we get the concept of the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory is the dwelling and whether it dwells between the cherubim and the tabernacle, which we'll see later on in the book of Exodus, or whether here we're seeing the Shekinah dwelling in the bush, is, it's certainly suggestive. Uh, those of you that are familiar with your Old Testament, this title we see here, the angel of the Lord, doesn't throw you, I hope, because uh, the word angel is actually a created being and normally. It actually means messenger. But angels, as they're studied theologically in the scripture, are typically created beings. There is one particular title, the angel of the Lord, that's used differently. And uh, those of you that uh, are familiar with this know that this is classified what, by a theologian as a theophany. Who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus Christ. You get a sense of that in verse 4. When the Lord saw they turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the bush. So it's God in the, on the one hand, it's the angel of the Lord. On the other hand, who is speaking out of the bush? God himself. And we would say, with our New Testament perspective, his name is Jesus. Or I guess if we're going to stay consistent with the Hebrew, we call him Jehoshua huh? or Joshua. But Jesus is the Greek that we're familiar with. Now, we're going to, of course, come across here with a vision of the glory of God. And one of the other things that you might think about on your way home tonight is how frequent do we see a vision of God? And you discover that it's not infrequent at all. Every great man of God seems to have that in his program early, before he's really called, or very, at least very early in, the, early in the program. Isaiah chapter 6 for Isaiah, Acts chapter 9, verse 3 for Paul, Matthew 17 for the inside disciples, uh, Revelation chapter 4 and 5 for all of us, but through the eyes of John, Daniel chapter 7, all examples of being confronted with the glory of God. Uh, relevant to uh, understanding his glory prior to being called to service. Very, very interesting pattern in the scripture. I have been fascinated with the burning bush because I think it's absolutely replete with symbolic or mystical significance. Uh, let's start with the fact that it's burning. What is fire in the scripture always? Judgment. Judgment, exactly. We'll see when we get to the tabernacle that those things that were to contain fire, like the altar, where the, it was the brazen altar, okay? Brass was the metal that they knew, that they used, that would contain heat, that could hold hot things, like a andiron or a cauldron or whatever. And so brass, as a metal, was suggestive of the capacity to handle heat. So the burning, the burning altar for a sacrifice was the brazen altar. Brass speaks of fire, thus judgment. We're going to talk about the incident we see in Numbers, where we have the brazen serpent. The brass, again, speaking of judgment because of brass's association with fire. We speak in Hebrews chapter, I think it is 12, verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. We know from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13, that he cannot even look upon evil. He can't do that. I mean, that's in, in a sense that the Hebrew writer is speaking there. Now, so fire speaks of judgment. What's being judged here? Well, it's this uh, bush. If we look at the Hebrew word for bush, it's senech. And that word actually comes from the verb to prick. It thus means a bramble or thorn bush, sometimes called an acacia bush. So we have here an interesting bush that's being shown. It's the thorn bush of the desert. Oh, now that gets kind of interesting. We have here, of course, a whole sermon, if you wanted to take the time, on the fact that God is judging and uh, what is he judging? He's judging sin. What is the symbol of sin? And introduced in Genesis 3, when God curses the earth because of Adam's sin, he institutes a symbol of sin called the what? Thorn. The thorn, right. Is he consistent in using this image? Indeed he is. When we see Christ crucified in the Gospels, I believe it's in Matthew specifically, we find the, uh, the Roman soldiers being very accommodating. I'm sure they were not rabbinical scholars and were not particularly mystics, but they accommodated us beautifully, or should say accommodated God's p program from the beginning of time by making a crown of thorns and placing it on Christ's head. 
Were they aware of the symbolism of the thorn versus the curse? I doubt it. I think the, the spirit of their mockery, it was a move they made, unre not realizing their fulfillment of God's plan. So here, God introduces the, in Genesis 3 the symbol of the curse, and we discover that Christ was made sin for us. He bore our sins on his brow, if you will, as he hung on the cross. So we have the thorns, a uh, symbol of sin. Well, how fascinating it is that the Holy Spirit stays consistent with his idioms of usage. That the thorn bush of the desert is a symbol of sin. Here we have sin being judged by God's consuming fire, except a very strange thing happens. The thorn bush is not consumed. We have sin in the hands of the living God not being annihilated, destroyed, consumed. What is that model of? Grace. Or if you want to be more precise, mercy. I often am guilty of doing the very thing I admonish you not to do, and that's get grace and mercy confused. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting that which we do. And that's really what I'm speaking of here, except we have his mercy through his grace, if you will. So I'll, I'll duck out my terrible use of, of uh, definitions by uh, that twist of things. But all right. The acacia bush. Fascinating bush. How interesting it is that we are saved because Christ became a root out of a dry ground. Remember Isaiah chapter 53? Let's refresh your memory. Isaiah chapter 53. Sometimes called the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He hath, incidentally, an acacia bush, a thorn bush, a bramble bush, as you might call it, has no form nor comeliness. There is no beauty that we should desire it. Isn't that interesting? And you can go on, of course, and, and uh, see the whole purpose of the crucifixion provided to us by Isaiah in that chapter. I won't take the time tonight. But if you, if you don't have Isaiah 53 virtually committed to memory, I suggest you spend this week not studying the book of Exodus, but studying Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, and those two chapters will endear you to the Scripture for the rest of your life. They're absolutely awesome. Psalm 22, a description of the crucifixion seen from the cross by Jesus Christ, anticipated 800 years before he was born. Very interesting passage. He quotes the first line from the cross, lest you miss the connection. And of course, Isaiah describes the purpose of it all in the theological terms that are no less eloquent than all of Paul's writing assembled together. A very, very interesting passage. Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. You should master those two chapters. If you've done that, we'll get back to Exodus chapter 3 and see what we have here. Now, there's another thing. I'm going to suggest to you, too, that this image of the burning bush is also prophetic. It's, as some people might say, dispensational. I'm going to suggest to you the word furnace or fire has another similar idiom in the scripture. And let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And I'm here, I'm inter interested in this to show you the idioms that the Holy Spirit will deal in. We've seen already that he's very consistent in his images. Let's notice what he says here in verse 20. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. Now, it's speaking, of course, the nation of Israel, reflecting back how they were brought out of Egypt. But what's the idiom of Egypt? Iron furnace. Speaking of their affliction, their bondage. Their bondage to what? To the Egyptians, yes. Spiritually, their bondage to sin. The fiery furnace is not only an idiom of judgment, it's also an idiom of tribulation. There are at least three models of Israel in the tribulation in terms of the fiery furnace. This is one of them. That is, Israel in Egypt, as exemplified by this passage in Deuteronomy and others of similar thing. There's another one that you may recall from our studies in the book of Daniel. You remember, of course, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, sees this polymetallic image that Daniel is called upon to interpret. He uniquely does, and of course, that puts him in a good position, gives him a good, good solid staff job, and alienates the rest of the staffers who are out to get him. And they find a way to do this, because Nebuchadnezzar gets on an ego trip, builds an image, modeled after his dream, probably, but instead of being gold, silver, brass, and uh, iron, and, and iron mixed with clay, he instead makes it all gold, because gold he knew from Daniel's interpretation was him, Nebuchadnezzar. His court advisors uh, uh, peak up his ego so that he, he requires them to worship the image. And we have Nebuchadnezzar's ragtime band, which whenever they play, everybody <laughs> bounds down, they worship him. And if they don't, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. By the way, they have found furnaces of that kind used for that purposes archaeologically. So it's an interesting testimony. But anyway, the point is, of course, you know the story that uh, Daniel's three buddies 
Azariah, Mishael, and uh, Hananiah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You all know that name. You know them by their Babylonian names. How interesting it is you don't know them by their spiritual names, nor unless you're a student of Daniel chapter 3. Point is, these guys refuse, of course, to bow down. The court advisors that were put down and outclassed in chapter 2 have now got their moment. They convinced Nebuchadnezzar that these three guys are not bowing down, so he have them thrown in the fiery furnace, which indeed uh, is exactly what happens. He had the soldiers turn up the furnace seven times hotter than normal. In fact, it consumed the officers that were throwing the other guys in. But they, of course, threw the three friends of Daniel into the furnace. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, in his anxiety to look inside, is all shook up because there's four guys walking around down there. He says, didn't we show three? And he says, yes, who's this fourth guy? The fourth is, and it's the interesting passage, Daniel, like the Son of God, right? We all know who he is. There are a lot of scholars who've written a lot of books who are a little unclear on that point, but we, uh, nevertheless, <laughs> they come out of the fiery furnace unharmed, except for the fact that their bonds were burned. They didn't have the smell of uh, fire around them. And, uh, of course, uh, that impressed everybody. <laughs> um, these three guys, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, are miraculously preserved through the fiery furnace, right? Who are they a type of? Is Terrific is Israel. So you got the whole thing. The furnace is the type of the tribulation. The three young buddies of Daniel are a type of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist. Terrific. Uh, there's another case. You'll find many of the prophecies of Israel yet future speak of the great tribulation as a furnace. Don't get confused by that with the fiery furnace of revelation. That's a whole other thing, and the prophecies I'm making reference to in the Old Testament are pretty crisp and clear, but recognize that the concept of going through the furnace is an idiom of Israel in tribulation used in Egypt, maybe possibly typified, if you will, by the passage in Daniel 3, and also uh, something yet future. So I mentioned that to you as an aside. Uh, one example of a passage of that, of the future tribulation of Israel spoken of as a fiery furnace, you can see in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, for those of you that want to track that on. But it's getting back to the burning bush, which was our springboard or departure for all of this. Uh, we have Jehovah in their midst. We have neither beauty nor comeliness represented by the uh, thorn bush itself. It's also interesting that we're seeing here uh, thorns rather than fruit, and thus as a type of sin and, and of their predicament. Now, one other thing, just to show you that my excursions and distraction with detail is not limited to just uh, burning bushes and things, I am fascinated with shoes. <laughs> shoes, yes. Um, some of you that see the shoes I wear think I'm not fascinated enough, but... <laughs> I do want to call your attention to this interesting phrase, verse 5. He said, Draw not near, put off thy shoes from thy feet, and the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. If we had a lot of time, if this was, you know, a six-month full-time course and something, I would be tempted to take this opportunity to do, actually, that which I'm going to suggest you do on your own. I think it would be great just to take this as a, almost a facetious example and say, Okay, Chuck, you think that everything in the Scripture is mystically significant. Right. Well, here's a ridiculous thing, shoes. Is our shoes mystically significant? That is, does the Holy Spirit, by communicating to us through 66 books written by 40 authors over several thousand years, is there a consistency of idiom, sentence structure, what have you, that the Holy Spirit engineers to convey meaning? I argue, yes, there are. He even encrypts some of the information in very mysterious ways, and that's a whole other subject. Let's, if that's the case, there might be some gold to be mined by chasing the concept of shoes. And what I'm going to suggest you do, if you haven't bought a Strong's Concordance or its equivalent, there's several other good ones around, I recommend you do so that you can find out where any word is used anywhere in the Scripture and use that as your treasure map and go hunting. And I'm going to suggest you take the subject of shoes and see what you discover. And you'll traipse through and discover shoes just aren't mentioned very often, except in some strange cases. You'll discover that shoes are mentioned in the wilderness. The, the nation Israel is going to wander in the wilderness for some 40 years. And they're going to be, uh, have on their feet shoes made from porpoise skins, sometimes translated badger skins. Don't make a big thing of that one. It's very interesting. That was one of the coverings of the tabernacle. We'll study this when we get to the tabernacle. But you notice these shoes are very unusual shoes. They never wore out. They preserved Israel for 40 years. So we say, hey, gee, shoes are kind of interesting. OK. Shoes represent walk or service, okay? We take off our shoes when we're in his presence because we're on holy ground. Our service can mean nothing before his throne. However, he miraculously preserves the walk, if you will, of Israel through the wilderness. How fascinating. Those of you that have a concordance and with lots of time on your hands, I recommend you taste that and see if it bears fruit. And uh, it's an interesting thing. 
Okay, let's continue now. We have Moses now with his shoes off before the burning bush, God calling him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. I want you to notice how many times in this chapter God speaks in threes. We're going to discover the ichyach, achshir, ichyach phrase coming up. The I am that I am is actually a threefold declaration. We're going to discover that he says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here, and he says it again later. You're going to, if you want to talk about the hint, at least, of the Trinity, you can see it coming at least in three ways in this chapter. Three times we have the threefold mention. And you can build on that if you like, but let's go on. He says, the Lord says in uh, chapter, in verse 7, The Lord said, I surely have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a large and good land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, <clears throat> unto the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. That, of course, will be Joshua's task subsequently. Now, incidentally, you can break this up into seven pieces if you like. If you look at the verbs closely, he's seen, he's heard, he knows their sorrows. He's come down to them for what purpose? To redeem them. Where? To the good land, a land of promise. He's going to take them on resurrection ground. Here, historically, you're going to confuse the land of milk and honey with the conquest of the seven tribes. If you discover the scripture spiritually, you'll discover uh, you can unravel the sentence spiritually and argue that he sees, he's heard, he knows their sorrows. He comes down for the redemption, takes them on to resurrection ground, if you will, which is separate from the conquest of the land. And we'll unravel this as we get further into the book of Exodus. Anyway, this is the whole summary of redemption. In the narrow sense, what happened to Israel then, in a broader sense, what's going to happen to all of us in God's climactic program for us. Verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, that's pretty neat. Moses, I want you to go to the, the ruler of the known world, the one that probably has a price on your head. Uh, this is the guy that runs everything, and you're going to go there, and you're going to get those people out of there. Your two million or so brethren, uh, I want you to get them out of there. Verse 11, and Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now that can be developed as a paradigm of the verb, meaning I was, I am, and I always will continue to be. It's a threefold development of the verb to be. It's also called the tetragrammaton, and it's a lot of uh, scholastic dispute as to how to properly pronounce it. It's absolutely fascinating. You think the irony of God is interesting in the positive sense. It's interesting about the irony of man the other way around. The Hebrew people were called by God to be the preserver of his word. Their primary contribution to mankind has been the custodian of his holy word. And incidentally, in candor, they've done an incredible job at that. There are characteristics of the Hebrew nation and its culture and its people that have done the most incredible job at preserving the text. They did not have printing or microfilm and that sort of thing. They had to copy by hand. All Hebrew letters, like Greek, have a numerical value. So when they copied a page, they would add up horizontally all the value of all the letters, and they'd add up vertically all the numbers, and they checked it all and had to add to the right sum. And they checked that the sum on the page they had and the sum that they had on the page they copied. If there was an error, they did not look for it. They burned the paper and started over. That was the rabbinical tradition. The result of that is when we find something like the Dead Sea Scrolls and we unravel all the different things they found, they found lots of other things besides the Scrolls of Isaiah, but what's fascinating is not the differences, the subtle item here or there in the text of Isaiah, as we found it there, plus the best texts that we had up of that day. The amazing thing is that they're so alike. 
The amazing thing is that there are no material differences, even though there's hundreds of years difference between that text and the text, the best text prior to that date. So as you get into all this, you can't help but come with an awesome respect for Israel and preserving the word. Having said that, though, I can't help but be amused by another irony. They were entrusted with the name of God. I am. God gave them his name. They revered that name so highly, they refused to pronounce it. And they put the Tetragrammaton in the uh, text instead. And over the centuries, forgot how. And the irony of it is one of the most interesting scholastic arguments, if you get into this sort of a trip, is, is it Jehovah, is it Yahweh, is neither, it's probably something altogether different. But the interesting thing is, we're not sure now how to pronounce it, because they revered it so high, highly, they felt it was unpronounceable. They weren't worthy to pronounce it, and through those traditions, lost it. Fortunately, we have him by a new name. In any, any case, we have the, uh, the I am that I am. And from here, time permitting, but you can relax, time doesn't, uh, there is a whole study that um, we could do because the <laughs> Gospel of John is organized around the seven I am statements of Jesus Christ. Now, one thing you should be aware of, I cannot resist showing you something else. The Gospel of John is seven incidences given rise to seven miracles, which give rise to seven discourses, and each of those discourses has an I am statement in the middle of it. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the living water. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. Those are I am statements. But there's another thing that occurs that I think is delightful, fascinating thing. Um, Jesus Christ, in chapter 8, gets into a delightful little discussion. It's a very important lesson for those of you that are going in the ministry to understand the role of tact and diplomacy when dealing with the unbelievers. They call him a bastard, and he speaks on their parentage, and it's a very, very interesting passage. Don't let, <laughs> don't let the polite King James fool you as they get into a conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 8, Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Now don't mistake the tone there. What they're really doing is raising the issue of, you know, that Mary was pregnant before they were married. Jesus answered and said, Ye neither know me nor my father. If you'd know, He ducks that issue, that slur. He doesn't leave it. He comes back to it. He says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Who's the first murderer? Cain, wrong. Satan, who'd he murder? Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3. It gets to verse 52 where the Jews said unto him, Now we, we know you've got a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? This is the accusation of the Pharisees. Jesus answered, verse 54, If I honor myself, it is, uh, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and he keep his saying. Now, that's his lesson intact in diplomacy. It's very interesting that Jesus Christ, confronting any kind of sin in the world, always met it with compassion and forgiveness. There's one group of people that he never failed to use vituperative, vigorous language toward, even losing his temper, in a sense. And that's the professional religionists of the day. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I suggest you're anti-religious in the true sense of that term. Religion in the sense that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves as opposed to adopting the covering that God had provided. Now, what's interesting here is that verse 56, Jesus continuing, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, we don't have any trouble with that, but they sure did. Verse 57, the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you're a New Testament reader or a Gentile reading that, that sounds like a strange twist of tense of a verb or something. If you're rabbinical in your background and you read that, you recognize that what he was saying was he was the voice in the burning bush. You and I would miss that idea, but they didn't. Notice verse 59, which proves it to us. <laughs> they took up stones to cast at him. Why? Because they were obeying the law. If one was to blaspheme and declare themselves God, the punishment was stoning. 
And that's what they were trying to do. He, of course, slips away. Jesus Christ in John 8 claimed not only to be God, but to be the very voice in the burning bush. I am that I am. Say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. God said, moreover, unto Moses, thou shalt, this back to verse 15 of chapter 3 of Exodus, thou shalt, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what, that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. How many tribes are there? One, two, three, four, five, I count six. There are seven, but they're mentioned six here. Why? Because typologically they represent man. What's the number of man? Six. When we get to Joshua and they go into the land, how many tribes are named? Seven nations in Canaan. And you're going to discover the, you know, the, the whole idea that they're going to, they are allied under a king which calls himself the Lord of Righteousness. And they um, defeat him by signs of the sun, moon, and stars. And after the battle, the kings that lost say, rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath of him who is to come. Whoops, I'm slipping this revelation. Anyway, the point is, Joshua is a, is a model of the book of Revelation, and the listing of the tribes even exemplify the conformance of that idea in the scripture. I want you to notice as we go through here, the I will, thou, they shall, thou shalt. I want you to notice the language of God allows no contingencies. Okay, there are no ifs, maybes, buts, perhaps. They shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. How long are they to travel from Egypt into the wilderness? Three days. Because that's the interval between death and resurrection. I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. Oh, that's interesting. You mean Yul Brenner didn't have a choice? When God's sure, I'd say that's certain. <laughs> and I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No. Not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Now notice that's something you don't want to miss, is that they not only left Egypt, they left with great spoil. Egypt gave them gifts to get out of there. <laughs> and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, and of her who sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, and jewels of gold, and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons, and upon your daughters, and ye shall despoil the Egyptians. I don't know how that must have sounded to Moses, because not only is he going to get that whole nation out of there, but they're going to take all this loot too. That sounded, that must have come across, that was a tough program. Chapter 4, verse 1, And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. The Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. He said, Cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground, it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. The Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. I suggest you study carefully what the rod means in Scripture. Psalm 23, 4, rod is for protection. So Psalm 2, 9, God the Father says to Jesus Christ, Thou shalt rule the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 2, 27, the same thing is made reference to. Now, it's interesting, one could argue that turning to a serpent is in the service of Satan, as we will subsequently see Pharaoh's emissaries did. What's the proof that it's not the service of Satan? Moses regained control, not by the power of Satan, but by the power of God. We could also look at Psalm 110, the famous four-verse psalm, whatever, six-verse, whatever it is, that refers to Melchizedek, also refers to the rod of God. So that's the first sign. Second sign, verse 6. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And put his, he put his hand in his bosom, and he took it out. Behold, his hand was leprous as snow. That must have shook him up. <laughs> Leprosy was an anathema 
because it was regarded as incurable. I gather in modern medicine it's not, but in those days it was. It was also a repulsive, offensive type of illness. It wasn't a type of illness that evoked compassion. It was a type of illness that evoked <coughs> abhorrence. Outside the camp, right? Two chapters in the book of Leviticus, chapters 13 and 14, are devoted entirely to leprosy and how they dealt with it. Not because leprosy was so prevalent or that it was the only disease. It was also a symbolic disease. What did leprosy represent typologically? Sin. Does that mean the lepers were more sinful? No. But idiomatically speaking, mystically speaking, it was a type of sin. Interesting, he put his hand into his heart. It's not the hand that contaminates the heart. It's the other way around. Isn't that interesting? Is that true of you? Are your hands contaminated because of your heart? And again, he put his hand in his bosom again, and he plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Now, by the way, he repeats this later on to demonstrate to the nation of Israel to convince them that he is sent by God. Because he could heal leprosy? No, because God has an answer for sin. Verse 8, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take the water of the river and pour it on dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. What's that referring to? If the nation Israel doesn't believe the first two signs, then that's going to happen. I believe he's referring to Revelation, the events that occur between chapter 6 and chapter 19 in the book of Revelation. Here we have that interesting, interesting rebuttal. Those of you that are called to service and don't feel you have a talent or what have you, I want you to memorize chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am of slow, I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee. Now, interesting phrase. I want you to notice this. By the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Now, the grammar there sounds like he's saying, you know, send me by whom you're going to send me. But it also means send me by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Who is that? The Mashiach. And, of course, from here we can go to a whole issue of other examples of reliance. Remember, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, When they deliver you up, take no thought of how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit which speaketh in you. So he means also, he says, The Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have spoken unto you. I think that all ties to the same thing that God tells Moses here in chapter 4. But let's move on to 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. When he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart, and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Now, it may sound kind of strange structure, but he's saying he's going to be subordinate to Moses, that Aaron will look to Moses, but Aaron will be the spokesman. So he's got sort of an advanced man, a, a speaker, a, excuse the expression, a mouthpiece for him. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, and wherewith thou shalt do signs. And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren who are in Egypt, and see whether they are yet alive. And Jethro said unto Moses, Go in peace. Very interesting that Moses' supernatural call by God himself did not relieve him of his obligations of amenities and responsibilities to others. He didn't just charge off and say, Tough luck, Jethro. I'm called by God to go to Egypt. I know I was supposed to manage your flocks, and I've been doing so for 40 years, and I have all the accounts, and I know where the payables are and receivables are and all that stuff. Too bad, fella. See to it. I'm called by God. No, not, not at all. He goes to Jethro, makes his peace with him, announces what he's doing, gets his permission. And that's something we might take to heart. That's something we might indeed take to heart. The Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead who sought thy life. And on that authority, we tend to believe that he exiled in Midian 
because he had a price on his head. Therein lies the, see, the model you get on the Ten Commandments isn't all Hollywood screenplay. A lot of that is based on good research. Verse 20, and Moses took his wife and his sons, set them on an ass, and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh that I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart that he will not let the people go. Go ahead, Moses. I want you to close this sale. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to do it. Don't worry about it. I'll handle it, but he ain't going to buy. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Up front, before Moses is even there, God is positioning his situation to treat Israel not only as chosen people, but in a sense, his firstborn. Egypt doesn't want to let God's firstborn go. God takes Egypt's firstborn, but he leaves that for his grand finish. But you notice that isn't an afterthought. It isn't a thought that emerges out of the sequence. It's a thought that God had in his mind early. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Interesting. Now it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And there's a whole thing I... Not going to have time for it, I don't think, but let me duck that problem for the moment. And Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. The issue here, without taking the time to develop the whole thing, is the question of circumcision, the requirement that the firstborn be circumcised. Zipporah is, you know, Ivan de Carlo, the wife of <laughs> Moses. And she eventually consents and uh, circumcises the son, casts the foreskin at Moses' feet. She consents, but she's really upset. And some scholars believe that's when she left him. You may be interested to know that Moses had a second wife. We're going to find out that later. And she probably was black. And there's a lot of interesting traditions about that that we'll come to later in the book. But just as an aside. Verse 26, so he let him go. And then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went, and he met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Now, there's an interesting problem here. Not a problem, but just a dimension to this that's kind of strange. Where was Aaron these 40 years? In Egypt. And God calls Aaron out of Egypt to go across the desert, meet Moses. They confer, they head back. In the mount of God. Where's that? Sinai. And kissed him. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which had commanded them. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed that when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. And that leads us to the end of chapter 4. Okay, let's just jump in and see what chapter 5 and chapter 6 have for us as it sets the stage for chapter 7 through 11. Chapter 7 through 11 will prove to be the plagues of Egypt, that famous sequence of events that provided such dramatic movie scripts for DeMille before he passed on. But we're ahead of ourselves. Chapter 5 and 6. Chapter 5, verse 1. And afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Now, I'm not sure that would particularly impress Pharaoh, but in any case, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Doesn't that sound like a reasonable request? <laughs> Scholars have spent a lot of time mulling over the specific request Moses makes here, because in fact, he really is going to ask for much more. He's really going to ask for the people to be freed as slaves and turned loose. That's not what he asks here. Now stop and think, this is a very understated request in the minds of many scholars. Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. One could get the impression that, hey, give them a day off, give them a holiday, and we'll go in the wilderness to worship our God and come back. That's sort of what you could infer from that. 
It sounds modest. In fact, it's so modest that many scholars have spent a lot of time wondering why does the scripture record what almost is a um, less than candid request. And the rebuttal is, there's many things we learn here. First of all, the whole issue is for God to demonstrate the unreasonableness of Pharaoh. If the request was, hey, turn loose 90% of your productive capacity, you could understand him saying, no, part of what God is doing here is positioning the contest between God and Pharaoh. And the first position is to point out that Pharaoh was unreasonable. That's candidly what this demonstrates. But there's other things that are interesting here. Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. What are they going to do when they get to the wilderness? What's Israel's side of that transaction? A sacrifice. They're going to sacrifice to God on Mount Sinai when they finally get there. What's God's view of that? A feast. Now, those of you that are prophecy students can start building a link of chain references from here unto a marriage supper, if you like. Verse 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Now, he's going to get an answer to that question in the next six chapters. Who is the Lord? He's about to find out who the Lord is. Pharaoh is speaking on behalf of the world. The world is going to find out who the Lord is. The world itself does not know the Lord. And in fact, to me, the most mysterious thing about the Battle of Armageddon, you know, all of us in prophecy love to study the end times, and we love to study the Battle of Armageddon. The strange thing is, the book of Revelation and Psalm 2 teaches that the world that goes to battle at that time knowingly goes to war against God. Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Now, obviously, this is a rhetorical question in derision. Did Pharaoh know the God of Israel? Absolutely. They had ruled this people for some time. And even perhaps in their unbelief and what have you, they're obviously aware of the fact that this desert people worship a God of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let, let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Verse 3, and they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, loose the people from their works? Get you unto your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. What's to be inferred here is that since Moses and Aaron arrived, they shared with the people their mission. They shared with the people these miracles, which obviously had to create a stir. They know they're about to be delivered. The deliverer, the much talked about, long awaited deliverer is now among them. And in fact, there's evidence that God has appointed this time, as evidenced by the various, the three signs that we talked about before. The people are stirred up. Were they working? Apparently not. Verse 6, And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Now, this was a real blow. As part of the brick-making procedure, the bricks had a straw element in them, which had several aspects. Not only did the fiber of the straw give the bricks structure, it was apparently an acid as a result of the straw decomposing that also had a chemical effect on the brick to make a superior form of brick as a working material. And obviously, up until this time, the raw materials, that is the straw, was provided by the infrastructure there. At this point, though, as a, a way of increasing their burden, they no longer were provided the straw. They had to go find it. At the same time, their quota was not lowered. That was um, a specific move by the part of the administration to show who was in charge. He shall no more give the people straw to make brick heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the number of the bricks which they did uh, make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish anything thereof, for they are idle. Therefore, they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. 
let there more work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words. And the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers, and they spoke to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where ye can find it. Yet not any of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters hastened them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, whom the Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? Very, very interesting situation that Israel, for relief, turns to whom? It, wrong approach, isn't it? They're turning to the world or to the leader of the world, if you will, to get their uh, response. Verse 16, There is no straw given unto thy servants that they say to us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten, and the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle, therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet ye shall deliver the number of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. After it was said, Ye shall not diminish anything from your bricks of your daily task. Now this is all calculated, of course, to give Moses a management problem. Then they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made us offensive in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And, the, and Moses returned unto the Lord, verse 22, and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so badly treated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Moses is a little upset, a little impatient. You think this is amusing. You should see the way the Moses deals with the Lord all the way through. Uh, Moses is obviously frustrated. God has asked him to go and present this petition before Pharaoh, and the latter case of the people is worse than when he started. And the poor guy uh, got pretty depressed. It's a very interesting how God, in every case where he brings judgment, brings someone to give warning and an opportunity to turn. Enoch was a preacher to the pre-flood people. In fact, even his son was named. You know, as long as he is here, it wouldn't come, or when he dies, it would come. And of course, uh, Methuselah is the son of Enoch, and, and uh, Methuselah lives longer than anyone else in the Bible. But the year that Methuselah died is the year the flood comes. And uh, Jonah, Jonah preached to Nineveh, and so forth. You can go through the whole scripture. The interesting thing is that same thing is true today. We're about to see the plagues of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, come upon the planet Earth. All kinds of evidence of that. If you haven't been to that, you'll love to study the Revelation tapes. But okay, let's move on and take a look at chapter 6. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now the Lord's being very gentle here. Moses was grumping. He did what the Lord told him, he thought, and nothing was happening, at least not immediately. The one thing you discover about God, he never seems to be in a hurry. But he says to Moses now, and I, I somehow feel that he's being so gentle here. Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand he shall drive them out of his land. He's not going to only let you guys go. He's going to speed you on your way. He's going to ship you guys out of town by the time I'm through with you. That's really what he's saying. Now, you might just for fun turn to Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. We often have a tendency, since we live in a time dimension, and thus God relates to us in a time dimension, and we see a chronology, we sometimes have a difficult time really understanding what God is about. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10 is one of these many verses that I think there's very interesting. In fact, you might want to start verse 9. Remember the former things of God, for I am God, he says, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things which are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God's pleasure is to deliver Israel from Pharaoh. Will he succeed? It was God's pleasure to pay for the planet Earth and a lot else with the blood of his son. 
it will be God's pleasure to purge the earth of its usurper. Will that happen? We might turn over to Isaiah 55, 11. God says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. If God calls you to proclaim his word, will it bear fruit? God uh, does promise that his word will not return void. God's word is inviolate, and that's what we're dealing with here. Moses had to learn that. God told Moses to make this request to Pharaoh, and of course Moses was discouraged because it didn't work on the first try. I want you to notice now the Lord goes into a discussion, a tutoring of Moses. And this tutoring or this explanation, this, this instruction, is something that we might very well be sensitive to. Verse 2, God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. That phrase is going to appear frequently in this discourse. It's a throwback, of course, to the burning bush incident. It says, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai, the provider, God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah, or Yahweh, or was I not known to them? Now, this verse has caused a lot of commentators a lot of trouble. The naive scholars have said, see, this proves that there were different scribes because we do know, in fact, the name Yahweh was known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Abraham, Genesis 13, 4, Isaac 26, 25, Jacob in 32, 9, and 10. And all our reference is where the word Jehovah is used to these people. What does this really mean? Several possibilities. First of all, the simplest answer to this verse is to know that in the Hebrew, it can be translated as a rhetorical question. That, to me, is the simplest resolution of our English translation here, where God is saying, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, and by the name of Jehovah. Was I not known unto them? El Shaddai is the name that speaks of God's provision. Elohim, we discussed, remember in Genesis, is the creator. Jehovah, as it's usually rendered in your English, is the God of the covenant. And it's the covenant relationship we're going to see emphasized. And in this particular passage, it's a very reasonable rendering of the Hebrew to render this phrase as a rhetorical question. By the name of Jehovah, was I not also known unto them? But some scholars also point out that the word known there in the Hebrew means experientially. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 makes reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the sense that they believed not having received the promises. In other words, there's a sense in which they didn't have a full view of the covenant relationship. So the word known here implies that it wasn't until Moses there was a possibility to experience the covenant relationship. And that's another reasonable possibility. So don't let that particular verse throw you. It is regarded as one of the problem verses, but only because of the way it's rendered in the English, not in the original. Verse 4 raises the issue, and that's really what we're trying to focus on. God says, And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Now this leads to a lot of interesting discussions. First of all, for 1,900 years... The denominational Christian church, in whatever form you want to take it, you can include almost all of them, has taken the position with respect to Israel that because Israel rejected her Messiah, therefore she forfeited the promises due her, and that the promises due Israel devolve upon the church. There's a concept in the scripture spoken of spiritual Israel. You know, I was spiritualizing Israel to mean the church. Now, frankly, there are several passages where that application is valid, where Israel in a spiritual sense references the church, but those are exceptions. The concept that Israel forfeited her promises because she rejected her Messiah gave rise to an idea that Israel was never to be regathered in the land. If you read the Christian literature of the 17, 18 early 1900s, you'll find all kinds of debate and discussion about whether Israel would ever be regathered in the land. You'll find people discussing uh, this whole business of prophecy. Even as recently as the 30s, you'll find 
many writers looking to what was happening in Europe, the rise of Hitler in the late 30s, as being the Antichrist and the an anti-Semitism that accompanied his rise to power. Actually preceded him altogether, by the way, but anyway, uh, uh, you'll find many writers looking at the idea that uh, that was the Antichrist and what was happening to Europe was what was uh, coming. There were writers in those days like De Haan and others that pointed out that couldn't possibly be because Israel was not in the land and they were laughed at. The whole concept that Israel would be reestablished as a nation was regarded as quaint literalism by naive fundamentalists. Now we smile at that because we sort of are used to that idea, but it's very interesting to realize that since May 14th of 1948, you would think that those debates would subside. They should have been put to silence as the nation Israel was born and David Ben-Gurion specifically quoted out of Isaiah why they're calling it Israel as opposed to some other name, that it was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Even sympathetic people in 1948 didn't expect it to survive a few days. In 56, they didn't expect it to survive a few days. In 1967, they didn't expect it to survive but a few days. In 1973, they didn't expect it to survive but a few days. Israel is in the land. That's something we shouldn't take for granted. The point is that the promises that God made to Israel are unconditional. There's no way she can forfeit her promises. No matter how idolatrous she became, no matter how unfaithful she came, God's hand was upon Israel. He's going to redeem them here in Exodus, and he's going to cure them of idolatry very substantially under Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian captivity and the events preceding thereto. But notice this, verse 4, And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. There is this whole issue of covenants, and many Bible outlines will take you through a seven-covenant model to try and study the Scriptures as it might divide by covenants, the covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, etc. But as you study those, and that can be a useful study because it'll help you understand the Scripture and how it's partitioned, you're going to discover a phrase that those outlines really do a poor job of, in my opinion. You're going to come across the phrase, the everlasting covenant. And if you read those other covenants carefully, you'll discover they're not everlasting at all. The everlasting covenant has to be made with somebody everlasting. The everlasting covenant, Titus chapter 1 verse 2 tells us, and Ephesians 2, 7 and other passages, was made before time began. Now, I got a clue for you. That's not Adam. That's not Noah. That's not David. That's not even Abraham. The concept of our redemption was a covenant that God made with Jesus Christ before the world was created. Those of you that want to study the everlasting covenant, you might study Isaiah 55, 3. Compare that with Paul's rendering in Acts 13, 34, Hebrews 13, 20, and so forth. Let's go to verse 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. What a comfort it is when you are in trouble to know that God knows. You might find it interesting to turn to Psalm 56. First of all, before you look there, how many of you have shed tears? How many of you could number the tears you've shed? Psalm 56, verse 8. Thou numberest my wanderings, put thou my tears into the bottle. Are they not in thy book? What the psalmist is making reference to is an awareness that your very tears are written in this book. Do you know when they were numbered? Before time began. Now, verses 6 through 8 are an interesting set of verses. Let's take them as a group. God continuing, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. He's going to start and close that phrase, and between those, he's going to make seven interesting statements. I am the Lord, he says, And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God who bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for a heritage. I am the Lord. That's the whole story from beginning to end. I want you to note carefully his uncertainty. I want you to note carefully the perhaps, or the maybes, or the if. No, it's not there. It's I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. 
we have seven I wills. The first is his purpose. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. That's far more than relief. It's one thing to relieve someone from bondage. It's quite another to rid that person of bondage. And again, as you read this, you should be sensitive to the analogy that God intends. Where Egypt is the world, our bondage is not to Egypt, but to the world or to sin. I will bring you out from the burden of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. God is going to do that to you and I. And I will take you to me for a people. God is jealous. God is interested. God is possessive. He wants you for his people. The will that can prevent that from happening is not Satan's, is not somebody else's, isn't Pharaoh's. It's yours. I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. Now, that's exciting. It's absolutely flabbergasting to see what people select to be their God. I love what Chuck Smith uh, preaches on, how you will become like the God you worship. That's one reason you want to worship Jesus Christ, because if you do, you'll be drawn to be like him. If you worship Mammon or Moloch or any of the classical gods, if you understand what they stand for, you'll also understand what you become by worshiping them. It's fascinating to me to go through a jewelry store or a museum and study the art forms of Egypt. It was particularly fascinating when we had the Tutankhamun uh, exhibits going through, as the world became just sensitive to this very, very great culture that we think of as Egypt. And yet, when you look at the bugs and things they deified, it's fascinating. We can chuckle, we can laugh, but our world is no different. God is going to selectively, specifically judge them the gods of the world. But God is saying here, I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God who bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Furthermore, that's not all he does. And I will bring you into the land concerning which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage or an inheritance. I am the Lord. Now there's a local sense of this, i.e. Israel being able to go to Canaan. There's a broader sense of this in terms of the land being restored to the nation Israel in the millennium. And there's even a broader sense yet in terms of our inheritance with the Lord. Okay, I think that brings us reasonably down to uh, verse 9. Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel. These are all the things that the Lord said to Moses, and Moses obviously passed them on. Verse 9, Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Now, it's very glib for us to try to sit here and say, gee, didn't they understand? But they're faced with the day-to-day -day burden, the trauma, the agony of being enslaved and abused. And this isn't a recent thing. This isn't a hardship they've endured for a year or two. For generations, they've been in this predicament getting worse. Now, one other thing we might do about verse 9, let's take a look at this. Israel was in bondage, right? They were in anguish, right? Did they have God's word at this point? Sure. God told Moses what he's going to do. He gave him the seven I wills, right? Even while we are in bondage, I'm going to suggest to you God's promises fail to bring relief. Now, let him, hear me through. What had to happen before God's promises brought any relief to them? The answer is the blood had to be applied. We're going to get into that, and it'll be much clearer when we get to chapter 11. But I want to point out right up front, having God's promises in your lap tonight ain't enough. Being able to quote chapter and verse ain't enough. Knowing God's gospel, his good news, his glorious promises ain't enough. What you've got to do is apply the blood of Jesus Christ, his shed blood to your life, if you are to be freed from the bondage of sin. Verse 10, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Go in and speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? Now, this is a throwback to Exodus 4, where he was saying, I am of slow speech and of a slow tongue and all that. Verse 13, the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now we're going to plunge into a fairly lengthy genealogy that extends through all but the last three verses of the chapter. So I'll skim through it lightly. 
Verse 14, these are the heads of their fathers' houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanak and Pelu and Hezron and Carmi, and these are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, uh, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Sheol, and the son of the Canaanitish woman, these are the families of Simeon. And these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon, and Kohath, and Merai, and the uh, years of the life of Levi are uh, 137 years. And now this one, it breaks down into the sons' families. You notice now they're expanding here. Uh, sons of Gershon are uh, Lebni and Shemei, according to their families. The sons of Kohath are Amram, that's the one we're interested in, and Izar and Hebron and Uziel, and the years of life of Kohath are 133 years. The sons of Merai are Mali and Mushi, and the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Why are the Levi expanded? Because they represent the, the line of Moses and Aaron. They're the family through which the deliverer comes. Levi is the third son. The third is the number of redemption. Verse 20, and Amram took Jochebed, his father's sister, in marriage, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, and the, and the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. Small point, by the way, when you read the story of Moses, you think he's the firstborn, actually had an older brother and an older sister. The sons of Izar is Korah and Nepheg, and I can go through and mispronounce these names to really no spiritual effect. Um, We'll skim it down to uh, verse 26. These are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are they who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron. Verse 28, And it came to pass in the day when the Lord spoke unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak thou unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? Now we're in chapter 7. The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. Now notice verse 3. It's God speaking. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. One of the reasons God hardens Pharaoh's heart is to give opportunity to show how strong he is. We might jump in and look at this a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 30 talks about Sihon, the king of Heshbon, who is hardened. Numbers 21 through 23 speaks of the incident. In Joshua chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, the Hivites are ones which the Lord uh, hardens. Romans chapter 9, verse 18 is a tough verse, but it's one that I commend to you. So I pick up verse 16, So then is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Verse 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will hardeneth. What that verse says is that God is God. And it's easy for us to say, well, gee, that isn't fair. A friend of mine was saying, you know, what's fair? Fair is when I win, you know, that's what's fair. <laughs> Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he with heart, he will hardeneth, and so forth. Paul develops this whole issue having to do with the election and calling and so forth in Romans 9. You might another comment on the same issue that may disturb you, but nevertheless we should hit it head on. Matthew 18, verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. There's a couple of examples that should be obvious. Judas was prophesied to be the betrayer. Does that excuse him? No. Does that relieve him of his responsibility? No. Hard for us to reconcile because we're looking at the same incident from two different sides of the time domain. See, we look at it sequentially because we're in the time domain. God is not just one who has lots of time. He is outside the time domain altogether. He can see the end from the beginning. Uh, uh, he has the capacity to tell in advance what it is we're going to do. It doesn't relieve us of us the responsibility. It just gives him complete knowledge. Antichrist is the same breed of character. Exodus chapter 7. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt. Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you. Why? 
that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring forth the children of Israel from among them. On the day before Saturday, on what the Jews call the 14th of Nisan, the ultimate plague, the plague of the firstborn, was taking place. And the 14th of Nisan, forever onward, would be treated as Passover. And we'll talk about that. Um, we will go through the first nine of the plagues next time. You'll get more out of it if you get a chance to read chapters 7 through 10 next time. That will position us very nicely to spend some time on the 10th one. The plague of the firstborn, which gives rise to the institution of the Passover. And it'll be our intention to discuss that in some depth because the spiritual significance for you and I there is, of course, far richer than worrying about why Egypt worshipped Beelzebub and lice and so forth. Let's stand with a word, closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this evening. We thank you that these plagues of Egypt are so remote. We thank you, Father, that you have indeed redeemed Israel from Egypt. We thank you too, Father, for the lessons you have here as you have redeemed us from our Egypt and our bondage. We would ask you too, Father, to give us insight that we indeed might also understand the bondage that we're in, the many gods that interfere that would command our worship in lieu of thee. Father, we would ask you through the blood of Jesus Christ and the ministry of your Holy Spirit to extricate us too from the bondage of the gods we worship and from the taskmasters that we are enslaved to. We would ask, Father, indeed, that you would keep our hearts and minds stayed on Thee, that you would indeed establish us as citizens of the Most High and mere pilgrims here. We would ask you, Father, as we go forth this week, that you would increase in us an appetite for your word, that you would give us guidance as we pour into these things. Lead us on those trails that have a specific message for our specific need, as only you can do. We ask all these things, Father, that we might come to know better and partake more fully in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, and in whose name we pray. Amen.